Tonight, in a special programme, the sky at night takes to the air in a converted jumbo jet. On board is one of the most amazing telescopes ever built. And we're going to see it in action. So welcome to the sky at night at 40,000 feet. We're on our way to NASA's Armstrong Flight Research Center, a couple of hours' drive from Los Angeles, because tonight we're flying with SOFIA, the world's only airborne observatory. It may look like an ordinary Boeing 747, but this ex-passenger aircraft has been specially converted to carry a 17-ton telescope that sees the universe not in visible light, but in the infrared part of the spectrum. Visible light, the light that we can see with our eyes, only reveals part of the universe around us. In fact, over half the radiated light comes in the form of infrared, which tells us about the formation of galaxies, of stars and of planets, and even of black holes. It tells us the secrets of our cosmic origins. You can record infrared light with a thermal camera like this one, or with the vastly more sophisticated SOFIA the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Before we took off, I caught up with the man who pioneered the observation of infrared radiation from the centre of our Milky Way galaxy, way back in 1966. He could also be said to be the father of Sophia, Eric Becklin. So we're here with this noisy aircraft behind us because we want to fly in it to go and look at the infrared. But what is the infrared? The infrared is the wavelengths of light that are beyond the red. It's a very important extension of the optical spectrum. And it's basically heat waves. So we are detecting heat waves out in space. Um, so why do we need a plane to get to these okay. wavelengths? Because it's like it's cloudy all the time down here on Earth uh, in the infrared. So we want to get up into the stratosphere. You get into the stratosphere, above most of the water vapor, and it clears up, especially out into what we call the mid and far infrared, where most of the radiation from our galaxy and other galaxies is coming out. I want to imagine what it would be like to be able to see the far infrared with my eyes. So let's get yeah. something familiar. Let's say I look towards the constellation of Orion, right. but in the far infrared, what would I see? The picture you get of what's out there in a region like Orion, where stars are forming, is completely different when you look in the infrared. There are some things that are completely invisible that you only see in the infrared. There's a bar of emission you see in the optical, but in the infrared it comes out really bright. And one of the things that you see in the infrared is something called the BN object. You discovered that when you were a graduate student. That's right. And that's the brightest source there. That, that is the... No, it is not the brightest, actually. There is... Okay. There are some things that are brighter, but it was the first one found. They're believed to be forming stars, and they're in the youngest stages of formation. So this is the closest region where um, massive stars are forming. The BN, or becklin neugebauer object, is 1,400 light years away in the Orion Nebula. It was discovered by Eric in 1967, the first protostar ever seen. And since the launch of SOFIA in 2010, Eric and his team have been able to explore the infrared universe in even more detail. You've looked, I know, at the center of our galaxy, at the center of the Milky Way, where there's this supermassive black hole. What does the infrared tell us about the galactic center? Well, first of all, the infrared is what allowed us to see that there was a black hole there, because there's so much dust between us and the galactic center, the light is completely extinguished by a factor of a billion. 
Wow, so you can't see anything. You don't see anything. Yeah, yeah. So you have to go into the infrared and you can see through the dust, just like you can a fire when it's smoky. They have infrared view cameras, see right down to the fire. We do the same to the galactic center. So that's how we actually saw there was a black hole. But now in addition to that, with SOFIA and uh, the mid and far infrared, we can actually see the dust orbiting around the black hole. So it's very much like the uh, fact that planets orbit around the sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but now we're talking about material and stars orbiting around the black hole. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to getting on board. Thank yeah, you very much. Well, have and a good and thank you for Sophia. I mean, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, I'm sure I will. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Back on board, the mission is about to get underway. Ready for takeoff, and for the next 10 hours, we're traveling to the cutting edge of infrared astronomy. We'll be finding out how this magnificent, slightly odd machine operates, and why it's so important for astronomers to view the universe with infrared eyes. By climbing 40,000 feet into the stratosphere, Sophia rises above 99% of our infrared blocking atmosphere. And now we're up here, the first job is to uncover the telescope and calibrate the instruments. So, where are we? What are we looking at? Well, Chris, we're about an hour and a half into the flight and we're looking at Mars. Uh, it's a calibration leg. Okay, that's what we can see on these screens here. Yes, the screens here are showing our three guide cameras and there you can see Mars in all three. Training the telescope on an object of known brightness like Mars lets the team calibrate the instruments and tune out the background noise. It's a standard technique to remove the background in the infrared. Now in the visible, this is not an issue. You don't need to do this. The sky is dark. The sky is dark, but at our far infrared wavelengths that Sophia is designed for and our instrument is sensitive to, you need to remove the background. And Mars, very interesting scientifically, is also a great calibrator. So for now, we don't really care about Mars. It's just a standard uh, light in the sky. Yeah, it's us. our standard star, <laughs> but we're using the planet. Yeah, we rushed to get here. Yeah, we had a, a, this particular flight, we had a narrow takeoff window of about 14 minutes to catch Mars when Mars was at an elevation viewable. There's something brilliant about rushing to take off in a plane because Mars is setting. Uh, I yes. think there's something wonderfully poetic about that. Yes. For the first two decades of its life, Sophia was a passenger jet. But it was acquired by NASA in 1997 and extensively modified. Where once rows of passengers sat, now a 17-ton, 2.7-meter reflecting telescope resides. To limit the impact of having a huge open door in flight, the fuselage was also modified to avoid turbulence. As the science team settle into their 10-hour flight, pilot Dean Neely has time to take a break from the cockpit and tell me what it's like to fly. So, how's your evening going? It's great. This flight's gone really well. Uh, a lot of work from a lot of people leading up to it really made this happen, so made it uh, fairly easy and smooth to execute. And so how does flying a plane like this compare to a normal aircraft? It's very unique for several reasons. One, it, it's huge, as you can see. Uh, one thing that uh, reminded me as we started the engines began to taxi out tonight, I always feel like I'm driving a stadium around. You know, you're so high in the air and, and steering this thing is unlike anything else. So it's a very large aircraft. And then you take on top of that, the special design and the modifications put in this incredible telescope in the back. I mean, there's nothing like it anywhere in the world. Because of those modifications, if you took, say, a commercial pilot who'd spent their life flying 747s, if you put them here and you didn't tell them about the back end, do you think they'd notice just from the way it handles? Uh, honestly, no, they wouldn't. Because of the, the amazing way uh, that they did the uh, aerodynamic modeling and designing with the structure in the back for the telescope assembly, in fact, when the whole back side of the aircraft opens up for the telescope to look out, in the front, I would never even know it, except there's a little Gosh. light on a panel that says it's opened or closed. So in preparing for an evening like tonight, how much back and forth is there with the science team? How much negotiation about what's possible and, and 
what the ideal situation would be. What you see going on here is only a small part of it. So the planning for this started many months ago. The astronomers and the science planners putting together a rough plan, and then they pass that to a, uh, an aircraft planner, typically as somebody who's a, a former navigator who, uh, who understands the flying. So as you lead up to the day of the flight, uh, they go a few rounds starting 36 hours prior to the flight, and then the last round to finalize the details of the timing and everything is 12 hours prior to the flight. What about when we're flying along, we're at 43,000 feet right now in the middle of an observation. Are you having to do things to try and keep the flight as steady as possible, or does the telescope take care of that for you? No, the, uh, the telescope does most of the precise hard work, uh, and what we've got to do is just keep the, uh, the aircraft as steady as possible because it's very sensitive. So when we make turns, we make very small turns, one degree at a time, maybe one degree every 20 or 30 minutes typically. And we make sure when we do those turns, we only use one or two degrees of bank. We have to think ahead because we can't just maneuver like a normal aircraft would, including climbs and descents to different altitudes, things like that. Yeah, I noticed this evening there's some negotiation or at least chatter amongst the team about when to climb and how fast to climb and so on. It seems collaborative. Yes, yeah, very much so. The people driving the airplane up in the front uh, have to work through the mission director who is kind of like the, uh, the orchestra uh, conductor working with everybody else down here, including the telescope operator. The one thing you have to get used to as a NASA research pilot is when you get in a group like this, I have to be humble enough to understand that I'm the dumbest guy in the room and just drive the plane the way I'm supposed to. Yeah, rather important, though. So we should yeah. let you get back to it. Thanks for your time, and um, enjoy the rest of the flight. Sure, it was great talking with you. Thanks. Sophia's focus is the far infrared, which makes it ideal for astronomers who want to peer through gas and dust. One of the biggest mysteries in astronomy today is how dense clumps of gas form into stars. Sophia's High Resolution Airborne Wideband Camera Plus, or Hawk Plus, is used to investigate just that. I caught up with project scientist Kimberly Enico Smith on the much quieter upper deck. <laughs> so, one of the reasons we're here on this marvelous aircraft is to learn about star formation. What do we know and what are the mysteries of star formation? Big questions, Chris, and questions that we've been asking for a long time and learning as we go. But if you think about it, some of the big questions about stars and how they formed are still unanswered. There's a mystery out there. Why, when we look at our Milky Way, or we look at other galaxies, why are stars forming in certain regions and stars are not forming in other regions? What makes those places special? What makes them different? And it's infrared that matters because that's where the action is. These wavelengths of light longer than our eyes can see allows us to peer deep into clouds that we wouldn't see in the visible. And that means we could get at the heart of you know, where stars are forming. A lot of the images that we're taking with in the infrared don't show the stars at all. They're showing the dust from which stars are forming or into which stars are going after they had at the end of their lives. So the study of dust is equally important to the study of stars. What does Hawk actually see? Hawk's an infrared camera, so it's taking pictures. And it works the far infrared and we're looking at the far infrared, and so we're going to be measuring cold things as dust being emitted, cold dust. I know there are results already, so can you, can you say something about what Hawks found so far? Yeah, so it's not published yet, but we Even had, better. I know, but it's <laughs> just really exciting. So one of the new developments in star formation theory is the uh, observations that there are these structures called filaments. So we've got some images here. So this is optical, I That's guess. in the optical, and you see this filament? It's this long, string-like, snake-like cloud. They could be several degrees on the night sky. And in the longer wavelengths here, you're seeing the gas along the filaments glowing, the re-emitting of the it's light. It's the opposite, right? In the uh -huh. optical, the filament's dark. Dark. But here, it's the thing that's it's burning glowing. brightly. And then you see the hot spots? Oh, These yeah, eyes? Yeah, yeah. Those were stars are forming. Or are they just formed? When Herschel did this all-sky survey and found these filaments were everywhere in the Milky Way, some of the filaments have stars and some of them don't. So there's a mystery. We're thinking this is how stars are forming along these filaments. 
but you know what can create the stars from forming what might stop them might speed them up a lot of mysteries so stars are forming in these filaments but it's not that the whole filament suddenly lights up bits of the filament no little bits but sort of like on your christmas tree with your fairy lights right, right? Okay. fairy lights on your tree by looking at the light from the filaments in detail, Hawk Plus can detect magnetic fields within them, perhaps a clue to how and why the stars are forming. So what's interesting with the new data from Hawk Plus on Sophia is measuring the magnetic fields on filament scales, actually looking at the, the shape, the orientation of the field, and we're finding they're perpendicular to the direction of the filament. So the filament goes across like this. Yeah. Then and the, the field, field is comes going down. Like that. Or like this. It's and material would tend to flow along the magnetic fields, presumably, possibly. One could, could guess. Or it could um, be a barrier. It's unclear. So one idea is um, just like, you know, a hedgerow on the countryside, and it's a windy day, and you have, it's you know, this time of year, we have lots of leaves falling down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have that wind blowing perpendicular to the hedgerow, yeah, 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 yeah. the leaves start accumulating. Huh. Yeah, Could yeah, yeah. the magnetic fields, if they're perpendicular, will be a channel to you know, add material or create instabilities for which chaotically things will collapse and form stars? So those are then the places where stars will form? Could be. And the critical thing here is that the instrument, Hawk, Plus allows you to look at what's going on in the filament. Previously, we've only had a really broad brush, brush look. That's right. Now yeah. we can zoom in and see where the action is happening. Well, it's clear we're just at the beginning of what Hawk Plus will do, so I'm looking forward to seeing the rest. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to host BBC Sky at Night. Thank you. On the world's premier flying observatory. We're well into the flight now. We're about a thousand miles off the coast of California. The telescope is looking at its science targets. The plane's moving around a bit, even though we're up at 40,000 feet, which begs the question, why would you put a telescope on a vibrating platform like an aeroplane at all? Making sure Sophia's telescope stays trained on its targets is Emily Bevins. So you're one of the telescope operators, which is an important position in any of them. Right. But what is the telescope operator? What we do as telescope operators is we control the actual telescope and movement to make sure we're pointing and collecting the data that we think we're collecting. It's a very narrow beam of light that you're trying to track on a view. And so you're just making sure that your telescope that you're using is collecting these really narrow beams of photons that we're getting from space. And so it's, it's, like, it's like a tightrope walk, almost. I was going to ask, with the movement standing in the back, watching the telescope wobble around, that seems like that would be problematic. Yeah, Sophia is kind of an interesting telescope because it is on the back of an airplane, and uh, that does change things up quite a bit from being on the ground. And so, not only are we concerned with tracking, but we're also concerned with the movements of the plane. Where if you have a ground-based telescope, you're not as concerned because it's not always moving, it's not changing direction. How does the telescope stabilize itself? And it has a series of pneumatic tires around it that kind of keep it pressurized, but we also have a lot of gyroscopes attached to it that keep it stable as well, which is really important for what we're doing here as telescope operators. So when you do see the telescope moving around, you want to panic. But everything's stable. Uh, it's a really well-engineered telescope. And so you're not actually watching the telescope move with you that's moving. It's pretty cold in here. Why don't you put these together? Very cold in here because we want to keep the temperature pretty equal to what the instrument is going to be at. So we're actually in the same room as the instrument. With the beer, of course, we've used many different instruments. Can you tell us how that works? Yeah, so we do a bunch of different instrument swaps, and it actually keeps it pretty exciting because you always have a new instrument every couple of weeks. So within the past month and a half, we've done three different instruments. And when I look down towards the telescope and things here, right. how much of what I'm seeing swaps out? The majority of what you're seeing with the telescope stays there. It's only like the back portion of it that comes off. And so each instrument's kind of different sizes, but they're all still pretty compact because we still have to get them through the plate door. It's really important to be able to, to, be able to switch them out back and forth so quickly. Um, it gives us a lot of access to a lot of science, a lot of different types of science. And it's a kind of a really special part about what Sophie is able to do up here. Well, you could never do that with a space telescope. It's much easier with an aircraft than a flight. It is, to do that. yeah, absolutely. Tonight, the team are using the telescope to investigate how stars evolve. 
but the ability to continually swap out and customize different instruments for different tasks means that Sophia has been able to investigate many different phenomena, from dust circling around black holes to the activity of passing comets, and it will soon have another string to its bow. It will be able to probe how planets form. Because NASA is currently building the next generation instrument, the High Resolution Mid Infrared Spectrometer, or HERMES. Before taking off, I met with Sam Richards, who's one of the team designing and building the instrument. So, Sam, thanks for talking to us. You're working on the next generation of instrument for SOFIA, something called HERMES. What is HERMES and what is it going to do? Uh, HERMES is looking primarily at protoplanetary disks, and these are disks around other stars, where once a long time ago in our solar system, it was just a disk of material, you know, dust and ice. This is the leftovers things. from star formation. Exactly, yeah. So it accumulates around in a disk around the star, uh, and then uh, those disks, the particles can join together and they build up, you know, small little pebbles, and then the pebbles become rocks, and the rocks become asteroids and comets and things like this. And, then and eventually you get planets. It's always amazed me that we don't really understand that process, how the dust sticks exactly, together. Exactly, yeah. So we have our own solar system, which is one data point, and we, we know it fairly well, but we still don't know why it's in the order that it is and where all, the, all this material and, and chemicals came, came from. So this is one of the key reasons why Hermes has been made. Um, so uh, with the high resolution aspect of it, we can understand how this material is moving around other stars and then how the different components like the water and the ice and the oxygen and all these kind of key life building components, how they come together and then they evolve over time to eventually create what would be a solar system like the Earth and with gas giants like Jupiter's and Saturn's and things like this. Why is it important to look at the water and the oxygen? What, what, what stories do those tell us? One of the big questions about like how Earth got its water and why it has so much water is how did we get here? How yeah, did, you know, where did it come from? We you think know? the early Earth was exactly. dry, right? Yeah, it yeah. lost all its water yeah. and we've got to get it back. Yeah. And we need the high resolution science to be able to figure out exactly kind of how all this um, chemistry moves around in the disk. Yeah, so that's the point, isn't it? It's telling you what's happened to exactly, this material yeah. over so time. So we're on this long journey to figure out where our solar system fits into the uh, the story of, of all the other potential solar systems out there, uh, and then we can figure out which family tree that we came from and then um, kind of backdate the models that way. So this is exciting stuff, and, and this will depend on, on Hermes, which I think will start flying, what, next year, something like that? Uh, yeah, so we're, Hermes is currently in the kind of building phase, so we're currently putting the components together, uh, and to achieve um, this type of science, you, you really need a high level of complexity um, which you, you can't really do from space, and so FIA is the perfect platform for this type of instrument. You're fairly new to the project, I think. Yeah. Have you, you've flown on Sophia. Yeah, so, so what was your first flight like? I'm a total fanboy, so when it comes to like NASA and, and this type of mission, you know, you get to don the flight suit, all the patches, and you're really going to get to enjoy being in the, in the moment there. And something that's very different to kind of ground-based observatories. Well, good luck. I hope all goes well. I look forward to seeing the results from Hermes. It's yes. really exciting. Yes, thank you. We're excited Thanks. too. Back on the plane, operations are in full swing. Although Sophia is based in California, it's actually a joint venture between NASA and the German Space Agency, the DLR. And on board tonight, the instrument is the German receiver for astronomy at terahertz frequencies, or GREAT for short. GREAT looks at the extreme end of the infrared, searching for atoms and molecules amongst interstellar gas clouds, because by looking at them, we can work out how stars evolve in the crucial first few million years of their lives. Instrument scientist Carl Jacobs tells me more about what they're trying to find. So Carl, we're here to talk about the great instrument. What makes it great? What we are interested in is knowing about the details of how stars actually form. And not only that, but once uh, when they burn, they give radiation back into what we call the interstellar medium. And um, to study those details, we all know these uh, uh, iconic pictures of uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Pillars of Creation. That's uh, right, yeah, which is the place where stars are forming. Where stars are formed. But the thing is, in those optical pictures, 
cannot actually see the creation because that is inside those uh, dark gas and uh, dust clouds. So uh, the optical radiation doesn't penetrate that dust. One of the main missions for GREAT is to understand the early stages of stars' lives and, and star formation. How do we do that using an instrument like this? With the molecular uh, radio radiation that comes out of these, these dark clouds, we can actually probe uh, the details of the physics happening there. So the motions of the gas, temperature of the gas, for ex and, and for example, collapsing motions. So you can actually see, you can look at it, what in an image would just be a blob, because you're looking at how things are moving, you could say this is collapsing, this might yeah, well form yeah, a star. Is, that is one of the data that we get out of those spectra, because we, we see the, the motions of everything and that really the physics, not just uh, the, the, the optical radiation or the pretty pictures, but really the, the detailed physics of, of what is happening in there. So if you look with this instrument at a newly forming star, right at the beginning of the process, what do we see? We actually can see uh, the, the collapsing motion of, of a molecular cloud that leads to uh, the formation of a star. So you could point and say, we now know, thanks to Greg, that that cloud might form a star. Yes, that is absolutely right. It would be good to know a bit about the objects or the observations that are being done specifically on this flight. One interesting goal, for example, was there, there was one source where people um, had a, 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 an idea, a model, how the movements of that source were. And so they, saw, they saw a double peaked structure in the spectral lines, which they interpreted as being two different uh, 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 speed components. Before. Some of the gas going in one direction or exactly. one speed and some and going at a different speed. I hope I don't, don't tell too much of the secrets here. Well, you haven't uh, you have told me which source, so I think we're I won't, probably I won't okay. Tell. But uh, in this, this three quarters of an hour that we observed that source, we shattered that theory. Oh, wow. So it, okay. so it's not true. It's not two components. So this is something you didn't know a few hours oh, that, ago. That, exactly. So that, that's a new thing. It's kind of amazing to think that we're sort of seeing what our sun was doing five billion years ago. Yes, of course, we cannot really observe um, the, the, the complete formation, but we can observe uh, different sources which are in different uh, stages of star formation. So that is how we learn how that, that finally works. Because we cannot, of course, uh, stare at it for uh, 250,000 years. Yeah, and one of the most amazing things about star formation for me is that we, we've known the basics for a long while, but the details are still very obscure, it's, we don't understand them. That is absolutely right, so that, that is what we are looking for, and uh, finding new things every day. By expanding our view into the infrared, Sophia shows us snapshots of stars and planetary systems of all ages, and put together, these snapshots help tell the story of our own solar system and build a clearer picture of the universe. It's about 3.30 in the morning. We've just landed and pretty tired and so are the crew. It'll take them weeks and months to analyse all the data that they got just from this evening's flight. One thing's for sure though, this is a marvellous way to fly and see the universe. We come back next month will be on the edge of the solar system. Until then, good night. Chris Packham and Michaela Strachan go in search of northern lights and the star of Bethlehem under a Christmas sky on the 23rd of December, BBC Two at nine. And the Sky at Night Book of the Moon is now available.